prepping for an upcoming game jam, at some point, every jammer faces the same question. What am I going to use to make my game? Well, look no further. I've got something just for you. Dotbig Bang is a fully featured, web-based game-making platform that you should totally use for your next game jam. So here we go. Let's just jump right into it. Here are 10 surprising reasons that you should use Dotbig Bang for your next game jam. You don't need to download anything. DotBigBang runs in your browser and works on any device. Laptop, smartphone, tablet, console, or even your smart fridge. All you need to do is make an account and you're ready to start making games. You don't need to worry about downloading or updating an app, how long your builds will take, or where you're gonna host your game. We've got everything taken care of for you. As long as you have an internet connection, you can start sharing your games right away. Topic Bang runs best in Chrome or Chromium-based browsers like Edge, Brave, and others. And if you'd rather not work in a browser, you're also welcome to install the desktop app. You can share your game instantly with a link and play with your friends. In order to share your game with your friends, all you need to do is click the share button, copy the link, and send it to them. Or just send the link that's in your browser. Once they click the link, they're already playing your game. And when you use the share button, you get a multiplayer link. So you can actually instantly play your game live with your friends. This mechanic is great for playtesting your game while your game's in progress during the jam, and really great for sharing your game with your family and friends once the jam's over. Your game will work on any device, console, mobile, desktop, you name it. Like I mentioned before, no need to worry about where to host your game or how people are going to play it. We've got that covered. If you're planning on working with a team, DotBigBang makes that super easy for you. Just by sharing a multiplayer link with your teammates, you and your teammates can instantly start building out your game together. DotBigBang supports live multiplayer editing with just the click of a button, and you can all playtest the game together while you're building it. Here's a big one. Networking is built in. So if you've ever wanted to make a multiplayer game, Dotbig Bang is the place for you. Every game on Dotbig Bang is multiplayer by default. All you have to do is share the multiplayer link. Our networking system is super straightforward. Entities in your game can be marked as networked by just adding a tag. And there are a ton of multiplayer games and scripts on the platform already that can show you the ropes of writing networking code. Also, we have great articles and documentation introducing you to the various concepts you'll need to know when you want to take your multiplayer aspect to the next level. Did you know you can have all the power of VS Code in your browser? Well, with Dot Big Bang, you can. Dot Big Bang has a built-in VS Code editor with TypeScript, complete with debugging capabilities and autocomplete. You can use the editor to edit code while the game is running and see updates happen in real time. We have plenty of documentation and videos that cover scripting and dot big bang as well. You'll have access to thousands of scripts for your use. Dot big bang creators have created tons of scripts that you can use in your own games. Just select an entity, select browse items, and you can search for scripts that other users have made. For example, if I want to make this door open, and I don't know how, I can search through scripts until I find a door script that works for my purpose. You can also remix other users' scripts to repurpose them for your own use. Remixing and repurposing scripts can really speed up your game making process during a game jam, where time is everything. And whenever you write a script of your own, you can easily share it with other creators to use the script in their games. DotBigBang allows creators to remix games, meaning that creators can actually get their own copy of another game and edit it. If you find a game you like and you're wondering how it was made, as long as it's set as remixable, you can actually take a look into how they made that game and how everything works. You can even make edits of your own or entirely make your own version of the game if you'd like. DotBigBang has made some starter templates that you can use as well, like a first-person shooter template and an obstacle course template. There's also a template for people who are new to scripting and want to learn more about it, or new to building out an environment and want to learn how to do that. So definitely check those out. You can find the links in the description. You're probably 
probably wondering where all these lovely art assets are coming from. Well, Dot Big Bang has a robust, built-in voxel object editor, complete with animation capabilities. You can make your own assets and then jump into your game and drag them right into your level. There is a huge library of voxel art for use in your game. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, what if I can't make art? You're in luck. Just like with scripts, Dot Big Bang has thousands of voxel objects made by other creators that you can use in your game. If you're working with a team, your teammates can make art that you can instantly drag into your game. And if you're an artist, you can make your own art usable by other creators. You can talk to the devs directly for help. If at any point you're stuck or need some guidance, you can reach out to the Dot Big Bang devs on Discord. The link's in the description. The devs have been making games with Dot Big Bang for years and are happy to help out creators as much as we can. We've also got documentation, videos, and live streams that show you all sorts of ways you can use Dot Big Bang. Whether you're an artist or a programmer, if it's your first game jam, or if you're a veteran, or if you're anywhere in between, Dot Big Bang has a place for you. So that was 10 reasons to use Dot Big Bang at your next game jam. If you want to give it a try, go to dotbigbang.com to get started and join our Discord to meet other creators and have your questions answered by the same developers who built the platform. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching and happy jamming! Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome everyone to day three, round three of Dot Big Bang here at the Global Game Jam. I'm excited to be with you all. If you're familiar with uh, me or not, I'm Summer, the community artist here at Dot Big Bang. And if you um, are familiar with our streams every Monday over on twitch.tv slash Dot Big Bang, what I do is we just have a nice artful Monday. We do the weekly art challenges together. We make lots of pixel and voxel art for people to use in their games, to use um, just in as, as interesting art pieces. And I'm excited to get into that with y'all today here. But first, yes, how are y'all doing today? I'm doing super great. Thanks, DMM. Y'all are doing well. Excited to make some art together. But first, let's have a little run around together here in the hub, because this month's hub is um, for the Global Game Jam, but it also doubles as our January Weekly Art Challenge Showcase area. So if you're an artist looking for a jam team, if you're a jammer looking for a jam team, if you're looking to get um, involved in any way, making games for the first time or making art for the first time, uh, definitely come check this out. Come join us for a moment here. All oh, right, I can't link. Oh. Ah, thank you, thank you for posting the link. So yeah, this is the hub. There's a handy little map here. And once everything gets good and going during the jam, if y'all have uh, games that you would like to have featured, please run them by me at the uh, over in our Discord, Topic Bang's Discord here. And I will personally build a cool festival stage featuring your game with a teleporter to link right to it so everybody can come and check it out. If you're looking for sites to join, to register, I've picked out a few that are online only in registration, so you can feel free to go check those out. Um, these are all free registration sites, online only locations or hybrid, and with a few languages involved, meaning English, English, Spanish, and English, French, whatever you prefer. If you'd like to join us over on Discord, I invite you to come and check out the Discord booth. And, uh, Oh, thank you. I'll, I'll post links here in a little bit once we get um, get rolling as well. Yeah, if you'd like to get involved with 
our Discord as well when you're making your games for the gym, when you're making your art for the gym, or just for our weekly art challenge showcase. Definitely come hit that Discord button over in the hub. And I'll make sure that your work gets featured. Yes, this is our weekly art challenge area. We do this on streams every Monday. And um, here today we'll be doing something very similar to that, but more like going back to our roots, just getting started with the voxel object editor. I want us to just go, go for it, get used to editing art or making 3D art. So let's just go right over here. We've got our account ready. I'm just gonna create an object. It makes you want an ice cream, the, the hub. That's awesome. <laughs> I really went for like bright pastels and fun vibes. Nice and colorful. We love color here. So yeah, welcome to the voxel object editor. If you are familiar with uh, or not 3D, pixel art, needlepoint, if you are familiar with any of those styles, this will come naturally to you. If you're not familiar with any of them at all, it's super quick to pick up. And we're just going to go do a quick walkthrough, a quick tour of all the buttons. I'm sorry, default friend, but we're going we're gonna to proceed without you. Now, here we have this nice little square with a plus on it. And this is basically our canvas. So we'll be looking at this a lot going forward. There's a plus sign here, which counts as our origin point. So whenever we pull any art that we make from here into a game, this will be the central point that things that are acting on it will be acting from, like rotations. If you're building a door, let's say we're building a door, we'll want them to have a nice little hinge right here. It's our little door. So that when it rotates, it opens right here from this point. And over here, you'll see it. I'm just kind of keying around buttons really quickly, but we'll take a nice little jaunt over here to the left. We're looking at our color window where we can, with our default color here, just pull this window up, go anywhere we'd like. Click Add Voxels, and now we're adding that color. And you think, oh, that's, maybe I want that blue back. All you have to do is click over here, click that blue, and now we're back to where we are with the blue. Nice and easy palette management here. And if you have a palette predetermined off to the side or you want to write down, if you're really into hex values and colors and such like that, you can always just put your hex right here. And all it'll update pretty much immediately. Here we have our add and remove voxel button. So Got a nice little smiley face here. We can remove just as easily. And then we have five faces. So let's say we have something and we want to extrude or add a face right from there. We can go add a face just like that. Easy peasy. We'll remove just as neatly. we want to paint, but we don't want to change the shape of anything or remove and then re-add with the right color. We can just go pick another random color here, say green, and go to our paint, paint nice little stripes, just like that. Or even we could go into the bucket, um, let's say a nice vivid red red color. And our paint bucket active. And there we go, easy. Now, I, I think you see me kind of hot keying through these things. It's really 
not a lot of keys to keep in mind. If you're looking for some quick shortcuts to just move through the navigator very quickly, it's all numerical. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I press one on my keyboard, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And we're already there. We don't even have to keep fishing over here. So pretty much everything you can do can be hot keyed as you wish, right onto your mouse or just turn your numpad on. I'm a lefty, so it's really beneficial to me <laughs> to just have everything on those little numbers. There's a few more buttons here outside of those numbers. There's ones up here at the top, these. And just a quick overview of them. Here we have, let's get pastel pink. I'm really feeling the pink today. And let's get Bam, this is our mirror. So anything we do on this axis comes right up on the other side. And our work plane, which is, imagine this gray cube, but just up here now. It's nice to build out from. So say I have something in between here and my work plane active. You do all kinds of cool patterns, maybe, maybe a fence. Or something. Not too much to worry about. I'm just pressing three to remove extra stuff and two to add. That could be a nice little fence. We could bucket it. And there, it's already, already ready to, ready to go. Nice little fence. I know it seems very loosey-goosey, but I think we should always start with any sketchbook. The first thing you should always do is absolutely ruin the first page, just figuring out what everything does. Just make a mark somewhere. Nothing too important. Just to get started. And it doesn't even have to be that big what we start with. So let's say while we're just sketching or we're just going and you're just like, oh, I've had no experience with 3D, I can't even draw a stick figure or a circle or this or that. And like, ah, oh, what do I do? How do I make games if I can't make art? So about the circle thing, you don't have to worry about that because like, thank goodness we're drawing with cubes, right? No circles. And if you can draw a stick figure, you're already ready to go. So say we have our feet here, a little pair of pants, maybe a little less pants. There we go. And a just somewhere in a t-shirt area. Get that flesh color back on our stick figure. Is this a dog wearing jeans? It can be. Hold on. We can make maybe he's part werewolf. We'll give him a a little tail. Our stick figure guy here. You, you you so wanted it to be a dog wearing jeans. It will become a dog wearing jeans. We will get there. The first for anybody who has just drawn a stick figure and they're like, oh, I, I don't think I can make 3D art. Look at that. We just opened this editor, what, 10 minutes ago, five minutes ago? Just ran through some of the buttons. Put the mirror tool on and made a dude. There's a little dude in his Calvin King, <laughs> a werewolf dude. <laughs> Maybe he has a little snout, I don't know. <laughs> and you think, do dog jeans have two legs or four? All right, all right. If we're, if we're, going, if we're going for that, we're going for it. Let's do it. <laughs> it's about to get real <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> He's going to be a centaur before he becomes a, um, <laughs> but 
Bam, bam, bam. Just gonna remove some of that. Well, let's get our brown, a little fur brown color. And we'll just paint color six here. It's a dog. Or let's do, yeah. There, it's a little pale. Let's fill it up the body a little bit. And I don't know, a little neck here. And <laughs> we're just adding little cubes until we get <laughs> some kind of dog shape. There, 10 second dog. <laughs> That could probably be polished up a little bit. Let's say just take the take a face down there. That's it's a little bit more dog like. There we go. Dog wearing jeans. <laughs> full body jeans. He's got them full body jeans. With the fur. <laughs> Little dog, little dog dungarees. You know what? Now I'm committed. I'm going to save this. So I'll just give him a name. Uh, dungaree Doggo. <laughs> there we go. Our first voxel object. Oh, wait. He needs eyes. He can't. He needs to see and a little nose. There we go. A little bitty nose. Dungaree Doggo. And a hat. Oh, right. Yes, a hat. A hat. Uh, let's see. A little straw hat, maybe? Can I can I convince you that he's wearing a straw hat in five voxels or less? How's that? And he's like a little farmer. <laughs> we're getting really invested in this character, but I think we we can go for it. Is that hat enough? <laughs> now now I'm convinced it has to be like wearing overalls or has to be like a little button. The overalls connect. Is that is that believable? Eh, no, we'll just call it Dungaree Doggo like it is. And I'm just centering up the camera here. Another thing that you can do is press F, and this just centers up whatever you're working on in the camera. And this also behaves, say you have um, under the Move tool, you can see this little yellow box, Select Anywhere. So let's say I want to select just the hat, just take a look at the hat. And I press F, whatever I've selected here, these pink lines, that's my selection area. I press F and now I'm right up into the hat and I can center up on it and maybe paint a little something. Now he's straw hat Luffy doggo. He's, uh, he's got a little straw hat with a band on it, but it's a little bit too tall, so I, I'll just undo that. Control Z, Control Z, Control Z. Yeah, just going back in general and centering up on the camera here with the F key. And I can press control and right click and pull in just like that, nice and easy. You can scroll, of course, but sometimes it snaps pretty strong. If you're using um, browsers outside of Chrome, this the scroll might be too strong or too faint. But what you can always do here is control key, right click, very finely pull in and out of whatever you're working on to get a nice zoom in on it. And we're doing this so we can take a good thumbnail. I like to make art anyone can use, and I want everybody to know what they can use as soon as they look at it. So I'm just going to take a good thumbnail with this camera button up here. Easy peasy. Dungaree doggo. This nice little thumbnail. Maybe it's a bit gray. Isn't it dog mullet fancy on top party with the bottom? Oh, <laughs> I missed some comments here. There was so much good going on. He's a land-owning farm dog. <laughs> if anyone from Netflix is in the chat, please make this show happen. I will make the rest of the cast. Everybody will be farm animals wearing pants of some kind. 
Any tips on a good thumbnail and making a good thumbnail? Yeah. So here I like to go for a nice three quarter. If I'm looking for something that is a tiled object or a flat pattern or something very simple, and we can make a few of these in a moment, but here, if I'm making a flat or tiled thing, I'll take a flat front view thing of it. But you see, like if you're looking at a, a creature or avatar head on, maybe you don't get to see these pretty little eyes or the doggy tail that really tells you within, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 voxels. We made this dog in 11 voxels. If you're taking a full frontal shot of a creature that's made in 11 voxels or less, you might miss some of these details. So put it three quarter, maybe angle it a little bit. So when you squint your eyes and you lean in a little bit, you're like, that's a dog. I can believe that's a dog. <laughs> can you be a tree in the distance, Digital Monkey Master? You know what? You can. Here in a little bit, I've got a plan. We'll make a, a DMM tree, druid, dude in the distance. You'd be like uh, those trees that you have in a play, right? Where you're <laughs> the kid that's like too nervous to read lines, like me right now, just a little bit, is like holding two branches and they're just standing on a stage. <laughs> I was that kid. <laughs> But yeah, three quarters if your if your shape is a little complex and a little bit like this in resolution. And then we take our thumbnail and it does this nice if you hover over it a little bit, it'll do a nice little turntable, which can help people like get a better 360 view on what your object is before they pull it in a game and see what it looks like. But we can also push this a little bit further. See how if I just click there, this color comes up. So say we're making something that we need to have in a series. We can change the background color of all the objects in that series as a quick little visual indicator that every object with, you know, this, I don't know, vivid red or I, I think this guy probably lives on a farm somewhere with nice sunny blue skies. So I'm going to click there, and we're just going to give them a nice little blue sky. There. Dungaree Doggo has a nice little blue thumbnail here. And we're going to save it by clicking here. But what if, like, all right, we've got our little doggo, but we want to do something a little, a little more with it. We want to keep this as it is but we want to do something a little extra, just like an extra sketch with a couple extra layers. If you're, you know, in any art program, you're like, let's just add a new layer and draw something on top of it. See if I like it or not. We can go and save it as a new object. Your big break in college theater was as a tree in Into the Woods. That's awesome. <laughs> like one rehearsal and they made me a piece. That is awesome. <laughs> All right, so we're saved as new. And if you go, if you want to be super sure, like I do, I always do, I'm paranoid about this. If you watch my streams, you will see me do this every single time. Even though I know it worked, even though I know in my heart of hearts that we now have two dungaree doggos, I have to go and make sure. And on our page, yep, there it is. Two dungaree doggos. We are working on dungaree doggo two, the Netflix sequel, Electric Boogaloo. Save it. You see how that is. There we go. Dungaree doggo, the original, the classic. Nothing will ever beat this. No sequel could. Um, but we also have dungaree doggo two. Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> Was it a <laughs> wooden performance? Oh, no. 
I'm going to have to take the rest of the day to recover from that. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I know how to recover from that. We'll just keep going. We'll make more art. <laughs> so you've always been thinking about a series where it's about the other characters, trying to avoid the main characters in a fantasy world because the story always brings destruction in the villages they go through. Ooh, you should write all this down. Oh my gosh, Taming Feral Kittens. Yes, let's make a kitten. We have, we have Dungaree Doggo. To electric boogaloo. But we could also just like, okay, kitten. I, I know I'm a little bit derailing, but we're going to make a kitten. So just going over here. This is my eight key to bring up my selection tool. Selecting, pulling that back. And we'll say, Dungaree Doggo needs a friend here. We're just going to make. A little friend for him, but we're starting like with our brush on the work plane. And I kind of want to make sure that their head, let's say, is still on the same level. So I'm going to bring up the work plane here. So nice and easy. There. That head is now at the same height. Just like that. And that was a little bit uncomfortable, wasn't it? We had it like just like that with the work plane, like kind of at this weird angle. And we're just trying to get really level on this one. But we can change with both the mirror and the work plane, the rotation axis that they're working on. So if we want to do anything with the mirror tool to move it around to control it, let's say shift up, shift down and now we're moving it we can move the mirror around we can move the work plane around that's no big deal say i wanted to make our cat have a more pointy nose i could move the mirror on the half voxel and now our kitty to be here as their nose coming to a point so if you want things to be odd numbered in their symmetry, this is something that's very handy to have and to know. And this also works for the work plane. So if we want to shift R, we rotate mirror on any of these axes. And if we have the work plane active, I believe it is Oh, not that one. <laughs> Always do this. Alt. So for the mirror, it's shift. For the work plane, it is alt. When you are rotating the axis of that. So now we have our work plane here on the side. And we can just kind of draw our cat from this one angle here. So with our mirror and work plane kind of lined up, I'm just going to move that. And Alt up as well to push the plane. There. And we have, maybe our cat is a bit fluffier. Cat's going to have a big fluffy face. Pointy ears. And I'm just going to sample the color, clicking one here, and then clicking with my mouse over here to switch between the colors nice and quickly. I grab my color, I go six, six over here, paint it, two, add Vox. Now our cat has a nice little mouth, meowth, if you will. Baseball cat for cat, can do, can do, we'll get there. So let's give them some eyes. <laughs> Big eyes. <laughs> I wonder if I can push them further back on the head. No. Let's keep them nice and forward. And our cat is going to be a little bit bigger, but I think we can also change the color here. So I'm just going to sample this color to make sure that these two aren't confused. For being the same creature, we're going to do a little bit to diversify them. 
Backwards because it's cool. Can do. Plus one on the cool cat. All right. Votes are in. Backwards cap for cool cat. Let's get a... What's a sprout kind of color? This is a cat I've seen around. Is it a bit of a grayish? Kind of, sort of. Hmm. You know what? I'll let that live. We'll just let it be for now. Let's not obsess over the details until we get the whole form made here. So let's get our work plane back up to make sure I can still keep doing what I'm doing here. Got big fluffy cat. Maybe this cat's doing a big heckin' spook, right? So they're going to have, you know, they got that arched back with the tail like this, and they're all, they're like, I don't like that dog. That dog is a farmer and it scares me. White, black with brown patches, right? Okay, right, white and black with brown patches. Okay. Can do. Let's get a little bit brighter, a little bit more in the cream palette. And bucket that. Light. Black. I don't know if I want to go all the way black. I, I never commit to like a full black and white unless I want to do a few in-game editor tricks, which hopefully we'll be able to get around to here in a little bit. But there will be a time when using just hashtag zero across the board can do some cool things when you're in the game with your object. If you want it to be recolored while you're in game, just a neat thing to keep in mind. Yeah, let's go with the, I don't know, is this this kind of close-ish? I'll say maybe they have like colors on the ears. Well, it's kind of like a bit of a Siamese cat, but it's not quite sprout. You know, without the reference photo, I don't know if I can. <laughs> not tens across the board. Oh, no. So just pull this bit of limb back here. I kind of like that with the arms being that fluffy. And we'll keep the tail that fluffy too. Or yeah, the, the back limbs will also be that fluffy. Just get that tail a little bit less of an arch, maybe a little less spooked. And there we go. Kind of a cat. Kind of a Siamese cat. Right, right. Can't forget the baseball cap. Uh, what does a baseball cap look like? Hold on. All right, so it's going to be a bit brighter. And they have like a little bill, right? Our, our baseball cap may have to be a different color. Let's go with like a navy blue. I think I've seen baseball caps in navy blue. I want to believe that that's true. Let's turn the work plane off for a bit. I'm not kept out of this central piece here. And let's just add that color back on top. <laughs> you know what? It's kind of like a little blue boy cap. Is that the, or the sailor cap? Or I, I'm kind of fond of it looking like that. Let's imagine that it's like, <laughs> what if we, what if the cap is the same color as the dungaree? Sailor Sprout. Yes, this is Sailor Sprout, who um, moonlights as a magical girl. <laughs> that is the story that I'll keep in my head now. For any Sailor Moon fans, right? Cap is the same color as the dungaree. Like the blue of it. I kind of like that. Keep the bill all the way out there. That's a little bit more. Uh, maybe they have that little button on the top, right? That's, that kind of helps bring it out of sailor hat. All 
But yeah, I'm also I'm also glad you're feeling better, prefab. Sprite. Happy to have you around for the stream. Oh, I didn't realize we had given our cat two tails here. Let's uh let's just get back into a little bit of a 3D view here. And clean up. I could have done this with the mirror tool on. I wouldn't have to do this, but it's only six voxels. Who's gonna Who's going to blame me? There we are. Now, I'll, I'll be honest. Our uh, dungaree doggo has turned into a cat completely. But I think we should commit to this being the object. So we're just going to clean up our canvas a little bit. I've removed dungaree doggo. And we're going to have, I don't know, let's think of a name for the cat. While I, while I do this, I'm going to just rotate our cat friend here with this button right there. That's the rotate. And pull our kitty forward a little bit. And let's get a different thumbnail. So I'm going to, again, I'm going to press F. I'm going to control right click and pull until I'm in about the right frame here. It's going to level that out. It is pretty cute though. I think I can allow it, right, John? Oh, I hope so. House cap. Hmm. Yeah, good name. We're just going to go cool cat. Cool cat. A sequel to Dungaree Doggo. Yeah. <laughs> and let's get that thumbnail taken. Just going to middle click here. Oh, uh, yeah, for navigating, if you're uh, new to 3D editors, we usually use the middle click to pan around like this. And for ours, we use right click to pull around just like this. And left click is how we're interacting with everything. Left click is how we're adding things, selecting and painting things. And that's it. We're already making 3D art. We made two creatures so far. I think we can go for one more. We've gotten through on our task list, our sketches. We've gotten through the object editor and the, a few shortcuts, some few tips and tricks. But I think I can get a couple more little tips in here. A couple more tricks. They could be handy if you're just starting out. I'm going to save Cool Cat here and let's go make a, an entirely new object. Do we need the voxel editor video? No, we've got each other. But whenever you don't have anyone around to answer your questions, just replay that video. Or you can always stop by our Discord, ask us some questions, especially with the voxel editor. I love answering those. Let's see, we're making, let's make a cool creature. Let's make like a snake. Because I think when you're first approaching pixel art and voxel art, you're like, oh, everything's blocks. How am I going to make like a, a curvy shape or something very organic? Like all Everything that I make looks so rigid and it's all blocks. So well, it's, it's, there's a few tips and tricks pixel artists have been using for decades. Probably needlepoint people have been using for even longer than that. And we can do them here just as well. So let's make the start of a snake. So with our shape tool over here on the nine with a rectangle selected, either hollow or filled, it doesn't matter. We're only going 
about what? Two voxels around like this. Let's do this again up here. And in the simplest sense, we already kind of, kind of sort of have a snake, isn't it? Just a little bit. It's a little stiff. It's a little rigid, but it's got the spirit. We can work on that. You don't need a lot to do this. So what we're going to do is just start with the idea of beveling or heading in a little bit at the edge, kind of imply a sense of roundness. And we can take away from one side, maybe add to another. And already it's looking like he's got a little bit, a little bit of a, a bend in that sharp L angle. But we can push. We can do more with this. So maybe our snake we don't need the mirror for this because we're going to we're going to put that little curve right. <clears throat> I'm just going to grab a little bit here, and we can pull one voxel at a time. So I'm just clicking outside of the shape here until I see this yellow cube clicking down, pulling out that shape until I have all of these selected, and then just. There we go. And you can use to add and remove from selection control and shift as well. So let's say I don't want to redraw this every single time, right? So I'll do a selection and with control, we're adding to that selection with shift, click, drag over, let's see these two voxels, we're removing from the selection. Oh, it's starting to look like the Medusa. Okay, so one weekly art challenge that we did together, I got a little too eager to make every prompt that was available because every time somebody hands me three prompts, I'm like, well, let's just do all three. <laughs> and I think it was a, either a mermaid or, or a Medusa or something, and a phoenix, I think was the third one. I'm not sure if they were all three in the same week, but I think we did all three that time. Yeah, and what we did, because I, I couldn't wait to find out who won the vote, we uh, on stream together made Mermusa, or the Mermaid Medusa. <laughs> and TMM, if you find it, if you want to link it, you can. But you can always just join us, and we make these fun things together as well. And we have something of an angle here just by grabbing and moving one by one by one by one, it, it kind of comes straight out in a line, just at an angle. So if this were a 90 degree one, like angle here, like that, we cut straight across it. But we kind of want our snake to have a little bit more than just straight line, straight line, straight line, straight line, right? Kind of want them to Look like they have a bit of a curve going. So we have like one, two, three, four, five, six points along here. I think we can start to build a curve out of this. So with one point of curve, let's say we'll build back out just a little bit. So one, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. So we can keep going with that, but you, you start to see like with just a little bit of pattern, we can establish a nice little curve. So let's say we want a pattern to determine our curve in steps. So we go one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, one, two, one. It's a nice round curve. And the more you zoom out, the more you kind of see the curve. That one's a very, 
very soft curve because it goes all the way through one, two, three, four, and five, but you can change the step of this by just doing, let's say, add voxel one, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one. And it's a bit more of a distinct curve, isn't it? Kind of just goes out like that. And I think that's about enough steps that we can get a nice curve for our snake following this kind of guide here. So one, two, two, three, two, two, one. Easy peasy. Let's do that. And with the face removal tool that's on the five key, just going to get rid of that extra. And let's start. We'll say one. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one. And we can add to that curve just following along the outside of it. So our snake is about two voxels thick, so we're just going to add one along here. Following this. Outwards like that. Let's say we go all the way around, all the way around, all the way around. Yeah. See, he's got a little, little nook to it. Let's pull that in to our snake just a little bit more. There we go. So it kind of can stand up on his own like this. It looks like he can can sit upwards. You think about curves the same way? That's awesome. Yeah, voxel curves, pixel curves. Um, doing this helps avoid a thing called jaggies in, in pixel art. And I think it translates a little bit the same way to voxel art, but with a little bit more give. Um, when you have a curve that doesn't quite read well and you're not, ah, oh, why isn't it, why doesn't it look right? What, what's that? So you're like, let's say we have one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. And you're like, well, that isn't quite, it's not quite reading right, is it? Why is that? So, or this? You like what? Okay, so you got one, two. Was it three, three, one, two, one? It's this one, two, one over here that doesn't read the same as the other end of the curve. That might be, might be like, ah, where is the the kink in the snake's tail? That's where it is. Just follow a nice little pattern. You can count it out in your head as you do it. And the more you do it, the more you get used to it. And you just like start doing it without even thinking it that you're doing it. So I want to say as if we're looking at it this way. One, 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 two. We're going to do a nice block of one, one. Let's just get that selection. Let's pull it further up. Maybe about to here. And let's expand it. Just going to grab that and pull. Expand a little bit here. I think we can go even a little bit further. Select, drag. Easy. Let's give our snake a little eye. Maybe a little nose. I don't know. Maybe get a little snoot on the snake. Is that too, too low res? That's okay. Now I have this nice curve and I could redraw it. We do like a good snake, that's where I like his person, but sometimes I can't be. Oh, you're angry with me. Oh no, why? <laughs> because you make art look so, it is, 
we've we've only been here half an hour and we're not even like this is what 20 voxels in 20 voxels or less i know you can convince me that this is a snake i know you can i've seen i've seen you do this too and i like i challenge anybody coming to dot big bang if you've done no art ever like let let the very simple nature of just cubes be and it makes it so much easier it's so much more freeing you don't have to worry about high-res textures and getting your line art just right or unwrapping and rigging the model and all that you don't have to worry about it so all you have to do is convince me that what i'm looking at in 10 voxels or less is a snake and i think we've done that And you can too. My little pep talk for for this half hour. All right, so I think we've got a good curve going in this direction, and I could redraw it going the other direction if we wanted our snake to be a real long boy. But I think we can do this another way. So I'm gonna just turn the mirror tool on here and like I think I can just, with a shortcut that had, all of a sudden has just left my mind. <laughs> but we can mirror our selection here. I think it's just pressing M and then, yeah, like not turning the mirror on. So what we're going to do, instead of using the mirror, we're just gonna press M for mirror. <laughs> Keep this one in mind. And then we're going to just click our rotation button right over here. So select mode here, rotate. We've pressed M. So what we've done is we've turned on mirror mode. Bam. See? Instant, instant reverse mode. It's like if I were, let's say, just rotating it traditionally, I would have to be like, oh, okay, we're facing the right way. So I have to redraw the head that way or rotate it twice more to get it this way like that or nah. We'll just M key, rotate the flip, easy peasy. I'm just going to select this curve now that we've got. Right there, control C. And you can either delete this or you can go backwards. But we're, going to, we're just gonna go backwards a step because our selection is in our clipboard right now. And we can just undo, undo, undo. There we go, there's our old snake. And now we have the curve going the other direction. We didn't have to redraw it. Now we can just pull it into place. There we go, now he's doing a nice little S curve. Our snake's a nice wiggly noodle. I'm gonna take a quick sip break there. Okay. Let's just center our snake. I, I should really start like pulling the S sounds out. We gotta center the snake <laughs> up on the on the board here. But I don't want to torture y'all with that. Let's just add a little bit more. Whatever we add, we take. He is alert. Maybe we can pull that head back a little bit there. There we go. Using what we just did. So one, two, one. There's the head. We can also do that thinking in the 3D space. We can just go one, two. We're pulling this final two steps up. I'm gonna grab these three here. We're just gonna pull that up one more time. There we go. Now he's got the little happy tail. You can mark off the summer irritating an animal square off your bingo card. Do I do that that often? Oh no. <laughs> 
Do I have the problem? Is the problem me? It's me? Hi? <laughs> All right, let's just give a, a little rattle to our snake. I'm just going to kind of swim around for a good little rattlesnake tail here. And you can paint the belly of them. So this part, it's, it's just for flavoring, really. But if we do this, and we get everything exactly the way we want it before we do what we do next, we will never have to worry about it again. <laughs> and I think I'm speaking to animators, if there are any animators out there that you're like, oh, I've already gone five frames in, but now I don't like that the snake doesn't have like a, you know, that little belly tone. Now I have to go back and paint it on every frame. No, just, we'll get it here. We'll just work until we get a nice solid pose here. And let's give it a save. What's, what's our snake's name? Um, only sometimes. <laughs> only sometimes. <laughs> yes. All right, we have successfully imitated a snake. Newt. His name is going to be Snoot, the snake. Let's take a quick little picture of him. Press F, control, right click, pull to just sort of give him enough real estate in his thumbnail. We want people that are in game to be able to just look at it at a glance and know instantly what they're looking at. <sighs> So our snake friend is looking a little bit static, but in the object editor, there is an animator as well. So right here at the bottom, you see this play button, you press it and nothing happens. It's because we have only one frame. We start with one and we can add as many as we want. He's a history professor. I think that this job title needs to have more S's involved. <laughs> He's a history. Oh, yes, you are correct. You are correct. He does need a fez. Thank goodness we, we got that on frame one. I was like, a fez is like a, it's a little red in color, right? This is a little bit like this. And then there's like, let's just use the same color here. Just one, tap that light green color and right clicking to just move around. Uh, press two to add voxels. Bam. <laughs> I think that's a that's a fez, right? It's is that kind of kind of sort of there? <laughs> You'd be amazed how many times you're in game and you're just like, as long as I can squint and I kind of be like, is that a fez? I can believe that's a fez. Ship it. <laughs> it's good. It's, okay. <laughs> All right, I have to say it. I have to say it, but this is the last time I'm gonna do this. Superb specialist in the study of his story. Ah, <laughs> we made it. Okay. But yes, we are. We want to animate our uh, fez adorned snake here. We start out with one frame, and we want him to move. So I'm just going to click here to add a frame. And so far, no motion, but you see this line is moving now. It's flipping between frame one and frame two at 200 milliseconds per frame. So we can move that to, let's say, 150 for frame two, 200 for frame one, if you really want to get into frame speeds. If you're doing something that needs like a tween or an in-between frame, but you don't need it to be seen for very long because you don't want to have a whole bunch of tweens. You can have like one or two with like an extended time or, or a shortened time. Or you can experiment with the length of your frames here. We'll just stick with the standard 200 milliseconds per frame for now. And I think we're just going to have him do a little bob. 
Let's give him a little idol. He's gonna, on frame two, he's gonna go dip down. Maybe this tail will move a little bit too. We'll move that to there. And maybe we'll pull it down one as well. So we grab that and just pulled it down. And we're already starting to see a little bit of motion. Sweet. Sorry, sweet. <laughs> oh, um, Brain HC. This is dot big bang. This is the voxel object editor within dot big bang. So whenever you make an account, uh, say this is your account here, you can just go here and click create an object. I'm not even going to hover over that because I'm going to give myself, oh, I'm going to panic if I move away before saving. But you can click here to create an object and you'll be in this window. Like you don't have to download anything. It's just right there. Right here in your browser. Yep. But yeah, welcome to the stream. I hope you have a good time joining us while we learn to do a little bit of, of voxel art and animation. And then we're here in just a little bit going to pull some of our handy dandy voxel arts that we've made just now into a game and we're going to make them do cool things. So we got one of our snake animation. Let's give it a quick save and let's add one more, one or two. I usually like to do four frame idols and no, not too much more than that. So adding a frame here, frame three, you're going to have like a bit more of an exaggerated action. So it's going to pull that much down. And we're going to pull, let's see, we're moving down, down, down. So let's just pop this by two down and this by one. So this is going to be the flick part of the animation where a lot of action is happening or, or has happened in between. And then on the last one, we'll be returning to frame one. And this is usually how I do quick four frame idles. So we have a single voxel of movement, the big part of the movement where everything moves like two or three voxels in a stretch. And then we start returning and then we come back to here. You can see a little bit of this motion now. I think we can add a little pizzazz here. Let's just take this. For no other reason than the fact that he's wearing a fez now makes me want to animate the fez. Maybe I just want to keep saying fez. There we go. That's the flick part of the animation. And I could just make a new frame here, draw everything on its way back. I could say like remove voxel here, add voxel, draw the fez back to normal and remodel this part and pull this back up. And but I could, I could, or I could just go back to frame two where everything was not far off from the starting action, just by one. I'm gonna select everything, control C. I'm just gonna go over to frame four, delete that, select all that, and press delete, control D. And there we go, our Fez adorned snake now has a little bit of a, a little bit of motion to him, just a little bit. Nothing too fancy. Let's give that a save. And while we do, I'll take a quick sip break. Excellent. <laughs> okay, I've got to stop. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Summer, no. <laughs> Summer, yes. <laughs> okay. All right, all right.
Hi, thanks, Tuplets. I see people are already seeing this. And this is because if you click the name, you can see the permissions that our object has. Um, up here, you see published, usable by others, and remixable. I prefer to keep all of these three things on because I love everybody being able to use anything that I make in any of their games at any time. If I make major changes to any of the objects I've made in the past, what I'll do is I'll save them as a new object so people can still have that previous version used and ready in their game. You don't have to worry about like, you've made this wonderful drawing, but you've gone back and changed it. Somebody has that object in their game, and now that object is showing up changed in a way that that game creator would not like. So this is why whenever I make a major change to an object, I'll save it as new, because I like to keep everything published and usable by others. That's just a neat thing to do. And remixable means that like, if they want to make their own changes for their specific game or just have a copy of that object without having to worry about that object being changed in the future, or even if they just, let's say they don't like a green snake, they want a blue snake. They can remix the snake at any point in time Oh, I'm sorry. Here is tiring. Uh, I hope you have a good time on the platform, though. Maybe try to make a... Why don't you remix my snake? Recolor it. Just for funs. See if that uh, improves. <laughs> I'm trying to think of words that involve S. Okay, I need to let that go. Yeah, I hope your day improves. All right, we've got Snoot the Snake. Dungaree Doggo. We've got the whole Netflix cast of animal creatures. He doesn't have pants. Oh no. Somebody who remixes this must draw pants. <laughs> All right. So we've, we've modeled a creature. We've animated a creature. I think we can go and make something that's not so creature. Like say we're making an environment for a game. Or we're just making an environment because we want to build a world to hang out in, right? Let's go create a new object here. Sorry, default friend. And if I were just coming over here from pixel art, I would say like, oh, it's my first time on a new thing. There's no tile set that I want to make a game for. I'm glad you like the fed snake. Charlie, thanks. <laughs> But yeah, let's say that if you're if you're used to making tile sets and you come to a new platform and you're like, oh, well, now I have to make a tile set for this platform. Let's say I need to make, like, I don't know. Do I have my, my little thing up here, my, my profile? I'm seeing my objects. We have to make, I have to make a grass tile and a dirt tile and a mountain tile. And then I have to make the mountain tile with the border for the grass and then with the border for the dirt and then with the border for the water and all of that for all of the others. Like you don't really have to do that. <laughs> it's the, the cool thing about um, doing this here is that you can have edge pieces if you would like, but you can import them as their own edge piece. You don't have to make them all gel like that. So I've just done... 10 voxel grass, 10 voxel dirt, 10 voxel mountain, 10 voxel house, castle, and water. And I think you can make a game with just one, two, three, four, five, six objects. Six objects and the three characters that we made in what, an hour? Yeah, an hour. So if you have a game jam and you're like, oh, I only have a weekend. Oh, you take an hour to make this. You took, I took, I made these in like an hour. We can make a couple more here in a moment. And you don't have to make this entire 40, 50 or more piece tile set to get started. Because within 10 voxels or less, if I can convince you that you're standing on ground, congrats, we have ground. And we can make it as big or small as we need. So let's say we have grass, dirt, mountain, because what's something else we could have? You know, I think... I think that's most of the major biomes. 
Let's try a sandy desert. Snow. Oh, yep. Two votes snow. We go snow. We have a snowy mountain. Snowy mountain needs to be in snow. Uh, but what was that mountain color? Was it pure white? I'm just going to open this in a new tab. Edit. And just to make sure I'm, I'm using the right colors here. Grab my color. Bam. Ah, that wasn't pure white. It was a little bit valued down. Because anything with pure white just kind of beams in the light too much. It doesn't quite read snow. So I'd like to bring it down just a little bit so that the light kind of behaves on it. All right, all C's across the board. All right, cool. So with that hex copied, paste, press enter. There we go. That is exactly that color. Uh, let's see. I'll do six and we'll just paint paint that. So in one, two, three, four, five, six. I lose my count all the time. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I don't want to draw all that. I'm just going to use the shape tool here. There we go. And you're like, oh, why is it doing that? Let's take a moment to just like, with the shape tool, and you put it down. See, so I've clicked in, and I'm pulling in one direction, two directions. If I'm making a little circle here, it kind of goes out like that. If I release the mouse, now we're moving upwards. So we've determined our width and length, and now we get to determine the height. And when I click in again, now we have width, height, length, all there. And now it's fully released and committed into what it is. But I can use this as well like a line tool, because I I've went to four years of art school to not be able to draw a straight line. <laughs> Don't worry. If you can draw a straight line better than me, I believe you. <laughs> All right. So we've got, we could say it's a snow block. We could, but we can add a little bit of texture. We have 10 voxels to play with here. Let's just make a little darker puffs of snow. And it usually kind of goes a little bit blue, doesn't it? It goes down in value, it gets a little bluer. And this paint, oh, it's a little bit invisible, isn't it? I think we can get away with more. Less value, a little more saturation. There we go, it's a little bit snowy. If you squint, you kind of see like, maybe there's a little patch of ice. And we can do a few of these. You got just little spots where maybe the snow is icier or not. Maybe we can have a different, bit, just a little bit less value, a little more saturation. And there we go. A little icy, snowy, something, something. Ten voxels or less. We're on task four now, right? Yes, we are. Oh my gosh, I have not updated them. Two, three, four, tiling objects. Yeah, let's just update our task list here. If I can ah, take a quick breathe and a quick sip of water. Hydrate everybody. That's important. So let's see, where is my task list? Here, in my tasks. Let's just start checking it, checking it all off because we've done a lot of this and I can revisit if people have questions, of course. So we have done a creature, animated that creature, and now we're on tiling objects. All right, space. OK, 
can't even see my other screen. <laughs> I get so used to looking at the big tablet that when I look at the little other screen, I can't, <laughs> I can barely, I have to lean in like that, the meme, you know, with the old lady and she's like holding the glasses. She's like, huh? That's me. All right. Are there tricks for concealing that there are tiles? Yes. Yes, there are. Let's just go ahead and save this as it is real quick and let's go check that out. I'm going to say snow, 10x. Oh, before we do, let me explain why I named these like this. So we've made it in 10 boxes or less. So if anybody that's like making a tiling object, start by 10, move in increments of 10 if you would like. Um, the snapping that we have in our game editor behaves very well out of the box with objects that are shaped 10 by 10, like 10 wide, 10 long, 10 tall. Um, it behaves very well. Just you hold shift, click and drag, and it's just snapping quite cleanly to that scale. So I say angled whenever I put a tile right here, like corner of the object is right here on the object origin. And the reason I do this is because it's a static thing and I sometimes type in their locations. And since I'm kind of used to um, pixel art uh, tile sheets, I kind of always have it in my head that the origin actually starts up here in a corner, not right here in the center. So sometimes I put the corners of things. We, we don't need the snow to be rotating around the center so much. It's not very animated. This is a uh, on the ground, right? So that's why I say angled. Whenever I make a tile piece, it's on that little corner there. I'm just going to take a nice thumbnail, save it. Oh, and just like the thumbnail tricks we were talking about earlier, like I said, when I make a flat thing and all you need to see is this, I just take a straight head on, centered up with the F key, and I grab that thumbnail. So you know at a glance, this is kind of a tiled object. It's not a round or sculpted shape of snow, it's a tile. All right, I think we've got some objects here. And we already have a little example, just a little bit of tiles in use here as if we were doing like maybe a top-down game maybe this is like a final fantasy overworld that we make we don't need the pieces that we've made to be very complex at the scale that they're being seen as if you were making like a 16 or a 32-bit pixel art piece you could just make it in tens or maybe in 20 and then have a nice resolution that's efficient to keep rendered and tile it almost endlessly from this. So when we're talking about tiling, let me show you what I mean. So let's say I pull the object that we made. Let's go into my objects here, here at the bottom. And oh, there's so many objects. I think I have a grass somewhere. I have a lot of grass objects. So we're going for grass tile 10x angled. And this is what we're looking at here. I pull this into the world. There we go. And let's say I want it to behave nicely with everything that we already have in our scene. So just to get it a little bit set up to behave with all of the things that we already have, I'm just going to go over here to transform because we can pull this around anywhere if you're just free, freely clicking on it. But I want it to be nice and centered up. So I'll just type in zero on the X, zero on the Z axis and we have a perfectly centered up tile that will you see how it's just kind of lining up perfectly with our other tiled pieces and this is at scale one that we're looking at it but we can increase that like we have a nice textured look if we just go with scale one scale local is one and you can have all of this nice 
grassy field look that we have going. And that's, it's nice. If we're making a huge game, I want us to just keep in the back of, the, of our mind how many tiles it's taking us to make the things that we're making. It's, it can be kind of overwhelming to just have to do this over and over. And then just control click to pull it out, uh, a copy from the object I just had selected. And then I'm hold, before I release that click, I just press shift. And now I'm in snapping mode here. And then when I get my snapping piece where I want it to be, I can release. And there we go, a nice snapped piece. But that can be so many, like this is what, four or five of them and we can control click a selection of them and we can get more of them. And we can keep going with this, but I mean, we're gonna be here a while. And it's gonna look, it's gonna look nice, but we're gonna have however many entities this is to render. This is what, 10, 20 or more? already. So if we have a very zoomed in scene, we can do that. Or within the object editor, we can reduce our entity count. Let's, let's see, go to dot big bang. Let's just remix my own object here. Where's my grass? There you are. I'm going to view that and uh, share it, edit it. Yeah, I'll just edit it. We'll save this as new. Grass tile, 10x angle. All right, that's fine. I'm just going to grab copy and paste copy and paste. And pull that there. Now we have like one entity that is four of those. So instead of having four of these to deal with, we now have one entity. They have exactly like this. So that's, we've doubled it. So we're going to go 20x angled on our grass here. Take a nice little thumbnail and save it. Snapping does change everything. Like if you've done a lot of manual placing, like making your objects, it sounds like, oh, it's so limiting to make something at 10 or 20 voxels. But like, you, I mean, we've made pretty believable forms, I think, with, with 10 or less. And just by doing that, you can already just, everything that you pull in the world is already efficient in its design and its geometry or the amount of faces and angles that it has to render. And now it's snapping. So everything will be perfectly lined up in the world exactly as you need it. So, oh, I'm trying to look for my glass here. So I'm just going to change the menu and come back. Oh, there we are. 20X grass tiled angled. I'm gonna center it back up. Another thing I want you to keep in mind is if it's flat like this, the collision can just be a box. This also helps with efficiency when you're setting up your objects in the world. If it's a flat thing and it goes all the way out to the edge in, in every side, it could probably be better to just keep it as a box collision. And you can even say, I wanted to sink my toes into this grass a little bit, right? I could adjust the height Let's say it's 0.5 right now. It's only 0.5 voxels thick. I'm just going to say 0.25. And let's go into the fly cam mode. And we see that this little blue box that is determining our box collision has changed. And now when we stand on it, ever so slightly, you see our toes have kind of sunk into the grass here as opposed to, you know, our unedited. It's probably easier to see at scale. Yeah, there we go. Our whole foot has fallen into the object. So your collision doesn't always have to match the geometry of the object, or it could even expand beyond it. Say like, 
in this in this castle object here. I could have the collision be a voxel object or a box because we're in an overworld view. You're not um, at this scale really interacting with it. It's more representative, right? So if I wanted to make sure that anybody in our overworld wouldn't leap on top of this, because I know people that love to just hop on everything in the game. So with our box collision on like this, you can see he's kind of standing on the sky here. To kind of keep the immersion, maybe we can just kind of sort of push the height of that somewhere you will not be able to jump to. Oh no. <laughs> Within, within reason, there is a bit of collision funness. Now you see what I mean. You can't really above on it. Does Dot Big Bang have a paintbrush for tiling objects? It isn't a paintbrush per se. But we could say make a nice selection. multiples here and if you want to set up a, an area like a workstation area where you want all dirt tile to be surrounded by a grass tile you can say this over here i'm just going to change the object here to my dirt tile and rename it dirt. dirt. And I'm going to keep this way over here. It's going to be like my little workstation area from which I'll say like I always need to have a stretch of three tiles of grass and a stretch of grass that is surrounding dirt. And I'll just grab and pull and pull. And pull, control, control, click, and drag. And you're like, oh no, I've lost my selection. I can control Z to get that back. And I can control click and just keep going. Well, I think I have dragged myself way away from. I'm just going to stop start. I don't feel like walking. Who does? <laughs> All right. So about a question I think you had earlier, Gaming in the Wild, you were, you were talking about how to hide lines. So when I first pulled these in, I went ahead and did some optimization, but we're going to go through some of it again. So you see how there's like, these nicely behave right up to each other like this. If you are trying to do what I've done, you need to start pulling them in as, as an object straight out of the, the search object tool. And you're like, why are there lines? You can see them. You kind of see these little lines here. And what it's doing is it's casting a shadow. So what you want to do is whenever you pull a tile in for the first time, if it's going to be a ground tile, what you can do is go into the object rendering here or the kind of settings that are adjustable with the rendering of an object. Like, say I wanted it to be more or less opaque, or, you know, if I, like we were talking about earlier, changed the emissive color of it to be, you know, whatever. What I want to do is I want to grab all of the tiles I've just imported. I'm go down here into the render. I'm going to turn off cast shadows because it's it's on the ground already. It doesn't really need to cast shadows. And instantly, that little invisible line is gone. And we can have like a nice swath of these tiles already behaving nicely, but as you notice, like you look at it and you're like, oh, it's a little bit repetitive. It's a little bit flat here. Like that. What we can do is say, after we've established a little map area, right? 
We can grab and rotate just a few of them. Maybe we can grab a selection and just rotate those. Very slight change. Maybe this grass is sideways for some reason. And we can kind of adjust little patterns into it, right? You can have fun with this. And this is also happening with the with the snap tool. So like if I just freely grabbed it and I was like, I want it to be, you know, some of the grass should be facing this way for whatever reason. And you're like, oh no, I clicked it, dragged it. Yeah, it didn't really didn't really do it perfectly. You could type it in, you know, 90 degrees on the Y or, or what have you, but it moves because it's on that angle. But here, this version, the one that you first open when you open a new game editor, you see these, these arrows. This one is kind of imagining a center that isn't on that angle. And when you hold shift and start rotating, it is acting as if the object origin is right there in the middle. So we don't have to put that object origin in the middle if we want a tile. We can keep it on the corner so that when we type in our positions to correct any misclicked thing, we can just go back and do you know, zero, zero. Pull it back in place. And we can just shift, rotate all day long. And it's like snapping nice and neatly to those 90 degrees. It doesn't seem like a big thing until you get like a huge stretch of tiles going, right? And you're like, oh, I need a little bit of variety at least. So we've got a little bit of um, a guide here. With the voxels scale. And you can see like these are all the same tile. They're all the same grass. They're just scaled differently. But these are all scaled, you know, kind of the same. So this is all objects that you're looking at. What kind of these two? We'll get to those in a minute. So all the objects that you're looking at here are made in 10, 10, 10, 10 by 10 by 10. But I've scaled some of them just to have a little bit of object variety. So this is out of the box, scale one, scale two, in a scale two grass, right? So you can you can kind of push with um, you can make some higher res objects some lower res objects but if you're if the main body of what you'll be looking at isn't super complex don't worry about making it this massively sculpted thing you need to go remove floor tile shadows from all your games go for it. <laughs> I play with that object render and all the settings in it. Maybe you can make your floor tiles glow. I've seen glowing floors. You've seen the Yayoi Kusama exhibit. It was pretty cool. I, I sidetracked myself here. Yeah, when it comes to scaling, you can get away with a lot, with a little. So start with a little, and you can get a lot of objects made. You can get your game done in a weekend, and you can scale it kind of neatly and it will still behave quite nicely. So don't worry about that too much. And you can pull in higher res objects, sure. Let's say, um, let's get a nice sculpted character that I've made. Uh, Wordle, I made you recently. Get in here, Wordle. He's a bit big. He's a bit bigger than the house. Sure, out of the box, scale one, he's a little bit. We can squeeze the scale down so it looks like Wordle lives in this house. We could. Uh, hello, I'm the only one here. Uh, I, oh, you're over on our YouTube. Oh, welcome. Yeah, we have a, a bit of conversation going as well over on our Twitch, but I can hear you over there on the YouTube channel. Valor332, welcome. To the stream and i'm happy to answer any questions you have and uh yeah thanks for coming to hang out so yeah uh, we have wordle here 
to like if we scale out to where our camera is and we look at it, we like we can very clearly tell that this 10 voxel sized object is a house. It's a house, it's a house enough for us to believe it. But this character is a little bit high higher res than he needs to be for the scale that we are looking at him. So not everything needs to be this complicated scale thing. We can get Dungaree Doggo in here. Dungaree Doggo was made in what? 20 voxels or so? Woohoo, we'll scale Dungaree Doggo as if they live in this house. And maybe Dungaree Doggo has a farm. Or not? I think I have some uh, little bitty cows. What are you making? Are you making models? Yes. So we, we've taken the first hour together going through the voxel object editor. We made some models. We made a dungaree doggo here. We made Snoot the snake. And we even animated. And I think we also made a cool cat with the baseball cap on backwards. And we've got a little environment that we made a few tiles for, and we're just setting up these tiles together to get you used to the idea of building a lot of objects very quickly, very low res, because you can do a lot with just a, a little bit of voxels and a little bit of repetition. So I think we've got a few low res. This is a single object, by the way, that I've just repeated the same very low res. You can tell it's barely, barely a cow. <laughs> I mean, if you really want to, there's, there's the udders, there's the, the spots. It's, it's a cow. It's cow enough to be believable. At this resolution, it's a little bit hard to see that it's a cow. You're like, you expect a little bit more resolution there. But if our overworld house is big, we can just have a little, you know, field of bovines over there. And maybe we fence them in. This doesn't have to be tiled so much. You could uh, type in the locations of any tile that you want to just like quickly set this fence onto, let's say. But I'm not too worried about that right now. We, we've, we've gone over a little bit of the tiling. And these little cows on this little farm that Dungaree Doggo lives on are now kind of fenced in. That's a nice little environment. <laughs> Is the cool cat spelled like K O O? -L cool cat. Oh, I missed that opportunity. I can't believe I did not spell cool cat with a K. I'm so uh, cool. I <laughs> cool cat. Cool cat. I think. Yeah, I, I didn't spell it with a K, but. You know what? I'll I'll go back and I'll rename that. Cool cat's got to be maximum cool. I've got to put cool cat on a skateboard. Can I add chickens? I don't think I personally have modeled a chicken. But one last little sidetrack here. I think that there are some cool little chickadoos somewhere. There's a lot of them. See, like these are all user submitted uh, voxel objects that are published, usable by others. So we can just kind of grab any of these here. And let's say, ah, the first one I saw, Bird King. Um, I'm gonna use that chicken. There you go. Yeah, nice little chicken on our farm. Easy peasy. Oh, uh, something I wanted to mention about the rotation. While I have y'all here, the mountains that I've used in this background, Grass Hill, Angle Distant, sometimes I like to have things have a nice little straight edge line, but on a diagonal. And I'll kind of repeat these for some quick background objects that are also low res, low diff, low, um, low complexity, because it's way off in the distance. It's just in the background. It doesn't have to be too much. But say I'm making a pine tree forest. We're going to look at my objects here, pine trees, my distant pine trees. I think I named these distant, all these backgroundy objects, I, I usually name them that way. And just out of the box, this one kind of comes in a little bit funny. It doesn't look like trees yet, does it? 
Well, that's okay. We're going to rotate it with the shift. We're going to turn it just a little bit. And now it's a little bit more like pine trees, isn't it? Now you can scale that maybe one or twice. I don't know, twice. Big pine trees. And then all of a sudden, when I try to shift and pull this through the world, it's like flying all over the screen. Oh no, my pine trees have flown off into the into the ground for some reason. Why are they there when I have the shift tool on? So what this is doing is when you have the shift tool tiling, it's using what transform mode that you're in. And it typically moves on the X and the Z. But if it's confused, because the X is currently way up here and not nice and level like, like this, it's currently at this angle, right? So what we can do is we can just go back into the world mode, because the world is always this way. See? Now we're nice and level here. And when we turn to grab and move our object around again, suddenly it's not flying off into the distance, no matter what we do. And it's staying at the same level on the y-axis. And that's great. That's exactly what we wanted. And I can pull that back down. So now we have angled objects that are also behaving with our tiled objects that are flat when you see. All right, I'm going to give that a quick save. So when I have a few tiles down and I can start decorating, I could like pull in, let's say, dirt. I can pull in dirt and I can go ahead and set it all the way up again. I can say scale to position zero, zero collision box, and pull it in here, and all, all of a sudden it looks funny. And this is because this is e-fighting, and we don't need that. We don't need to do all that. What we can do here is say a mountains, they need to be in snow, right? So under our voxel object renderer, it's choosing a voxel object right here, and it's already in place. Its collision is what we want. Its rotation is what we want. Its scale is what we want. So we can just go to anything that we have that matches that 10x angled, like the snow we just made. Bam. And now we have a snow tile. And we can do that for multiple objects, I believe. We just grab our snow. There, see? Multiples. And that's already done. And you get all of your scene out here and set up, and you're like, okay, it's nice and tiled, but maybe it's a bit rigid still. Maybe I can just control click on this orange cone here and pull. And maybe I'll just make a few little angled pieces. We can start having fun from here on, right? It's a little bit snowy, right? It's a little bit of a snowy expanse. We've got a little bit of variety. Not everything has to be this tiled and rigid, especially once you already have your scene in place. Now you can start styling it out a little bit. You don't have to worry about um, your tile sheet importing into certain game creating tools and like it can only ever be rotated this way unless you draw it that way. Like, I really like that about Dot Big Bang. So when I put the model in the game, can I use it as a map if I size it up? You could. There are a few example games that use a drawn map for UI. Um, I recommend Brad and Heather or Punkerella Summer's example games, especially one with uh, a Doodle Safari. If um, if there's a link to that one somewhere, that one. Um, has a map in the breakdown version of the image that is in UI and it shows you how to set up a UI map in a in a pretty interesting way. So you can kind of just stylize your look. But you could also, if you wanted to, um, 
have all of these entities repeated somewhere else as a map as well. It's really however you want to do it and however many entities you want to run in a game. I like to run a pretty low amount because I want everything to run nice and smoothly. So right now we're like moving at a buttery smooth almost 60 FPS here with 128 entities. You can get as complex as you want. You can add entities until your game starts slowing down. It's up to it's up to you, however complex you want it to get. And I don't want to limit you with uh, the scale of objects or the number of objects. These are really just ideas to keep in the back of your mind. Like if you've added a lot of very complex, very highly sculpted things, and all of a sudden it's running very heavy, you can simplify some of these things. And it doesn't take long. Like we made how many objects, how quickly? <laughs> We already have a nice little environment here. I think I can have some snow. Or maybe a little a little pond somewhere out here. Let's um let's get a little a little body of water. I think I have uh this. This will be our pond. And we're just going to make sure its rotation is back to zero. And pull it back into place here. Nice and easy. I'm going to replace that with a water object I've made. Let's see. Water 10x angled. And you're like, okay, well that's that's technically blue like water is, but it's not like it's not water water yet, is it? <laughs> and that's all right. We'll get there. The first thing we can start with, like probably the first thing that pops up in our mind is, well, water's not opaque, so let's pull that down. Maybe 0.6 or something in the object renderer here on our thing. And it's not just going to go straight through. Maybe this could be underneath it. About there. And this collision, let's set it to, set it to something else. Yeah, we could stand on it like we're standing on the grass here. But we want to be able to jump into it, right? So I'll set this to trigger and let's add a script to our object. Because not all scripts need to be actively making things blow up and rescuing princesses and uh, teleporting you and opening chests and doing the cool stuff. Sometimes you just need a a little bit of push to make the objects in your environment believable as what they are in your environment. So we're just going to look for something to help us splash into the water here. I'm going to look for splash. If I can spell splash. <laughs> and let's grab that. There we go. And what this is going to do, it just, um, we pull in an effect template. And it's going to play that whenever we run into the water. So right now it's not doing anything. I think there's a couple of splashes that, are, that we already have. Let's try. I made one just to just to get ready, just to experiment. And you kind of see, oh, there we go. It's splashable. A little splash of water. If our character is uh, switched out for something to scale, let's say, you know, maybe we're this big now. And we can splash in the water. But to set that up, if you want to make your effects look a little bit differently, what we can do is set up our own template here. And some objects I'll animate aren't really objects at all. They're more like environment con like examples, like ripples in water. Or I think for one of Charlie's games, I made like ocean waves. I think this um, doesn't always have to be a creature or a building or a treasure chest. Or, like you can make objects to represent things happening, right? So let's go to my... No, let's just look for all. There's somebody that's made a wonderful water splash animated object. It's called Splash. There it is, VFX Water Splash by Voxelius. 
And there's a nice object. We pull it in and it's animated. And that's pretty cool. So the, within the voxel object editor, the animator, the same one that we use to make the snake, they've animated this splashing water effect. And that was pretty neat. So I'm just going to do a few things to set this up as if it were, let me just pause this for a moment. I'm gonna turn off play in the renderer. And I've pulled it in and it's like casting shadows. So we gotta turn those off. Uh, maybe it doesn't need to be super opaque. Eh, we can keep the opacity, why not? But maybe we can make it like a white, white splash, at least a little bit brighter of water here. And let's pull that back out here. Oh, uh, another thing that I'm doing that you can keep in mind, I'm just pressing like one, two, three, and four to move between different modes of editing here. So with the multi-tool, you can rotate, pull vertically, um, scale, you can click this and it will automatically kind of snap to any surface that you're pulling it against. You could also use the move. Move it just statically along a single axis or grab here and kind of do the same thing. And it's like limited to the Z axis right now. Rotate, it's rotate. It rotates um, around from the center here. And scale. So I, I, these are hot keyed, just like our voxel object editor. There's one, two, three, and four. So we've got our splash and I'm going to add an object to make sure that it destroys after a certain amount of time because when we play the splashable effect it pulls this object in it plays it but it doesn't make it go away so we just need something to make it go away when it's done so let's say I think it is destroy after delay dbb destroy after delay there we go oh and it's gone <laughs> but that's because it was destroyed after a timer. So we're just going to have to do this part with the game stop so we can see what we're doing. And I think it takes, once play is turned on, about a second. Let's try a second. For it to cycle through the animation one time and then disappear. We're only splashing it once and then the ripple disappears, right? Well, uh, very close, but not quite. Let's try it one more time. We'll try point 0.8. Keep our fly cam active here. Stop, start, and there we go. A little bit closer, not quite. Let's try point 0.7. Play, almost, almost there. Point 6. Why not? There we go. That's perfect. Yeah, okay. Well, the script works. I hope so. <laughs> okay, so we have this at about the right scale. It can be a little bit smaller. For what we're doing, this object is a little bit big. It's a little bit complex, but we can we can swing it. We'll just turn the... Just like that. It's on destroy after delay. And let's go ahead and save this as a template. Last moments here, we'll, we'll make this happen. Going to go down into the entity, template, new template. We're going to call this slash two. I made this joke twice now, electric boogaloo. Can't say that without saying the other part. And that is a template that this script, our splashable script on our body of water, can reference. You can use the voxel object component and look through the animation to find the exact time to. Yes, yes you can. I took the long way around there, that's true. All right, so in our splashable script, I'm gonna switch the splash effects for splash to electric boogaloo. And let's press, press play. And our character, let's make sure that they are small enough to enjoy this pond, our tiny pond. Oosh. <laughs> and you're like, oh no, what happened? Our, our character has disappeared. I know exactly why this has happened. This is because in our reference object here, 
the collision of this object that we pulled in was still active. This doesn't need to be, there's no reason for it to be. So when you're standing on any of these objects, you are parented to them. If they disappear while you are parented to them, then you disappear with them. This can be very handy if you're making things like a moving platform. So say that I'm standing on here and all of a sudden like I just want a moving platform. I can make a sign script to make this platform move. Let's say vertically. There we go. And now we're moving up and down with the platform. And this could go X as well. Now we're moving with this. So this is why we want this parenting to by default be on, because usually it's very handy. But for what we've just done, <laughs> let's kill that. Um, for what we've just done, it isn't. With this object, being able to stand on it, once it's destroyed, we're destroyed. And we don't like that. We just want to splash around in the water. So we've turned the collider off on it. And just to make sure that change goes through to our water block up here, I'm going to push that to the template, save it, and play. There we go. There we go. The water has finished animating. We are splashing. We are splashing now. That's wonderful. And we are not being deleted. There we go. Cool. I think we've set up a nice little environment here. And we've had a nice uh, round of making some objects. Are there any uh, any questions that like came out while I was just on a roll <laughs> trying to animate some water? Right here near the end of our stream today. But if you if I glazed over anything too quickly, like with the voxel object editor animating or pulling any of these objects in to to set them up and get ready to game with them. I'm happy to answer them now. What language does dot big bang use for scripting? Uh, I believe it is TypeScript. And if you'd like, actually there's a stream tomorrow. Charles will be here in the morning. Let me just get the time for that. And if you'd like to see um, Charles do some sweet scripting, that will be on the 26th at 6 a.m. PT or Pacific time, 9 a.m. Eastern time. And they will be doing TypeScript coding and dot big bang multiplayer. And I totally invite you to come check that out then. Yes. Are there any other, uh, oh yeah, 2 p.m. to 2 yes. <laughs> I think it will be rebroadcast at the same time as today's as well. Oh, that's nice. So yeah, if you, uh, if you miss it in the morning, and just like we're hanging out now, you can come back and see it. Maybe we can squeeze one last thing in here because our water is still just kind of looking a little bit flat. I'm just going to make a little bit of particle effect on it. Just while I see if uh, any other questions come in here at the end of the stream. Oh, oh gosh, they're everywhere. <laughs> Maybe we don't need so many particles. Let's pull that down to 250. No, nope, still too many. 100. And it's going all over the place. We don't need that. Maybe just, there you go. That's a nice little splash. Let me get to where I can see this better with the fly camera. Oh, yes, we have lots of uh, docs and info over at the docs.bigbang.com. You should definitely go and check those out as well. We have a Discord. Um, where we will, our dev team usually hangs out and answers questions. Again, if you're if you're a creative type like me, if you're submitting art or looking for a dev team to join for the jam, we have the Global Game Jam channel where you can look for a team. We have a team finder. We have the weekly art challenges where we um, challenge each other to make voxel art and effects and stuff and uh, feature them. 
And if you are in our Discord and you are also doing the Global Game Jam using Dot Big Bang, I will happily feature your game in a stage in our Global Game Jam hub if you let me know about it on the Discord. We have example games. Yep, uh, DMM is linking now that are also accessible through the Global Game Jam hub. Um, findable over on our Discord or on our front page right now. They're even featured. So even if you just land on the site and you're like, I don't know what do, I want to make game. There's how to edit the player template. There's things like how to do all of this stuff. But yeah, I, will, I won't keep you all much longer. But thank you all for coming to hang out. I hope you all enjoyed a nice artful time. You can also join me on Mondays on twitch.tv slash bang, and I like to do nice artful streams like this. I hope y'all all have a wonderful day, and I can't wait to see y'all tomorrow morning for Charles. Have, have an excellent day. Do something creative. Have a great time, y'all. All right. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah. Thanks uh, for the for the great two-hour stream there, showing people how to make cool stuff in dot big bang uh, and thanks to dot big bang of course for sponsoring the jam again this year we're super happy to have you back and excited to see what people are going to make with uh, dot big bang uh, global game jam this year um up next we are going to have our friends from hyperpad joining us uh they will uh be showing you how to make games on your ipad uh with uh with their tool